Tēnā koutou e hō mā, kou libi ligans toko ingoa. First, I just want to say thank you so much to WWF and Department of Conservation for including me as part of this really important kaupapa. Um, I'm a senior lecturer at Massey University and also a research associate at the Auckland Museum. And today what I want to present really is work that's been led by my students, Irene and Jenny Ann, with the help of um, several other agencies and also individuals, some of which are in the room today. So as Vonda and Matt have talked about, I think in New Zealand, we have quite a good quantitative handle on how the physical and physical ocean environment is changing as a result of climate change. And those impacts are, have already happened, right? Um, Matt also talked about the fact that we are quite good at projecting or modeling into the future, but what we don't have is much evidence around those measured responses to climate change. So climate change is already happening, there should already be biodiversity responses to that climate change. And Matt talked about a couple where again, um, I'll reiterate and talk more about um, similar examples where it is a little bit correlative, but I think it, it's time now that we draw on these inferences and um, have more talks like we're going to today about what we can do now with that knowledge in hand. So although we don't have much evidence for these local and um, early biodiversity responses in New Zealand already, we need only look overseas for inspiration. So internationally, we know that climate change is already impacting the local marine biodiversity of several places, and that is in turn affecting the well-being of communities that rely on those spaces. These changes are really dramatic. So if I draw on the example here of Japan, where over a space of 20 years, we saw a change from a colonia kelp forest, like what we have around mainland New Zealand, to what is more reminiscent of a coral reef. And these changes can also be really rapid. So just because we haven't seen something happen yet doesn't mean it won't happen next year or the year after. So this is an example in Western Australia, where again, we went from a colonial kelp forest and in a matter of a couple of years, it's turned into this turfing community maintained by um, what was initially a heat wave and an, an associated incursion of some tropical grasses, which graze on the kelp and keep it um, from reforming. So my research is really interested in what are those really early and very local signs of biodiversity responses to climate change that we can harness and see as individuals, people who are interested in our ocean and our local um, environments, before we suffer those really catastrophic ecosystem changes and those impacts on our own well-being. So these are things like the new arrival of some species where it hasn't previously been found, local population growth of a species we may be interested in, population decline or even local extinction of a species that we used to harvest, for instance, and also things like local adaptation. So this is where my research is really focused and I'll talk about some of these um, examples today. First, I'll just mention that um, these local responses that we would find in our own moana um, are influenced by things such as ocean circulation that we know would impact the immigration of new species into an area, but also the recruitment dynamics of those locations. And also, of course, that locally changing environment. So an environment might become more favorable for some species um, and less favorable for others. And these are the things that impact those local environments. So if we first think about what would be those first indicators of change in our New Zealand coastal environment. Um, this is some work that's been led by my PhD student, Irene Middleton, who's very soon going to be starting as a um, research scientist with Niwa at Breen Bay. And she really thought about tropical and subtropical fishes as being a potential indicator um, group of species for New Zealand. And this reasoning is based on the fact that these species are known overseas to respond quite quickly to um, those environmental and physical changes in our ocean climate. And they're also very conspicuous. They're quite easily to observe, particularly um, in amongst a whole lot of drab, more temperate um, reef fishes that we have in New Zealand. So this is the group of taxa that she uh, decided to focus on. 
So what we did was we examined occurrences in these tropical and subtropical species in New Zealand to characterize what might be biodiversity change and to hopefully at least set a baseline for future monitoring. And many of these species are actually resident in New Zealand. They're not just living in tropical and subtropical areas. They are resident and we've known that for around 100 years. But what hasn't been done is a real consolidation of those occurrence records. So some are published, many are not. And what we also did was we um, set up a citizen science platform called What's That Fish New Zealand um, to help solicit some sightings of these species to get a better handle on where they live and how they're living. So one unanticipated result of soliciting these um, sightings of fishes from citizens, um, these are people in our everyday community, was that we found a whole bunch of new records for um, fishes in New Zealand. So here we have 17 new to New Zealand species that have been recorded by citizen scientists, and these are their photographs here. Of interest for today's discussion is that predominantly these are tropical and subtropical species that are now being recorded in New Zealand for the first time. Based on the occurrences of tropical and subtropical species that we've consolidated, um, we can see that these species have been um, observed in increasing abundance through time and increasing diversity through time. So overall, with those new arrivals of subtropical and tropical species, we can say that there's probably an overall trend of increasing tropicalization of our New Zealand fish fauna, and this is in coastal areas. Um, or at the very least, we can now, I guess, um, recognize that these subtropical and tropical fauna are a much larger part of our fish fauna in New Zealand than we probably previously recognized. And these could be really good indicator species to now monitor and take heed of um, as we move into the future. So to understand how these individual species may actually be responding to the climate changes we've had over recent decades, um, we would ideally have time series monitoring. So like what Matt talked about, where there was those robust surveys um, happening, and this, this is on fishery species, we don't have that kind of data across the board for all of our marine biodiversity and all the kinds of biodiversity that we actually draw value from in our local marine environment. So our method that we developed was to use um, an expert group of people so experts as in scientists in New Zealand, as well as those experts in our community who have a lot of local knowledge about what's been happening in that marine environment over their lifetime. And we used, we developed a protocol of um, defining the species ranges, known and historical ranges, um, defining how detectable or how much confidence we would have for a species given that range. And we classified these citizen science observations we had through um, our What's That Fish Facebook page and the past records in amongst that to classify them as within range, so not indicative of any kind of range change, and out of range, which may be indicative of some kind of species distributional change. And we did that all with a measure of um, confidence that we assigned. Okay, so what we did was we distinguished those occurrences that were within range and those that were out of range, we could classify as being between somewhere from extra limital vagrancy, which was an individual um, larval or juvenile fish, for instance, that may have just recently immigrated into an area but may not survive necessarily, right through to um, more evidence that suggests range extension where we've observed two or more adults that are mature and therefore had the potential to um, breed as well as over winter. So when we did this across all of our focal tropical and subtropical species, we found that um, there was hotspots of distributional change around the Tutukaka coast and the Bay of Islands. And I don't think there's any surprises there for people who frequent those areas. Overall, we found 57 species that were identified as having out of range occurrences based on our method. Um, and what these classifications indicate is what species may be going distributional change and whereabouts in New Zealand. So this research presents a baseline for future monitoring. These are the species that may be in these regions of New Zealand we want to keep an eye on. They may be undergoing change and if they're not undergoing change now, they might do in future based on the range distributions that we were able to um, collate as a group of experts around a table. It also, I think this method provides a um, base, or sorry, a proof of concept for how diverse information, such as that information that's held by citizens of New Zealand about their own regions of the world that they know very well, they know their own beaches, their own patches, how that kind of diverse knowledge can be used um, alongside 
um, I guess, these more traditional and quantitative forms of science to um, help identify what those biodiversity responses to climate change are and will be in future. It's not a perfect data set. There are several caveats. So the first one being that this relies on presence only data. We don't have records of where these species are not and where they are not changing. We rely on what we have in terms of positive records of these species. So we only have as much information as we get from those places that people have observed these species. So for that reason, we have a huge um, amount of information about the Poor Knights Islands because a lot of people go there and they see a lot of things. Um, the other, I guess, bias that we have potentially in the data is that, of course, for the purposes of this research, we're focused on tropical and subtropical fishes. So here we're not saying that all the distributional change in New Zealand is happening in northeast New Zealand, but for this set of species, it seems that this is where there is a bit of dy dynamics, I guess, going on with ranges. And what would be really neat in future would be to roll this out for more of our native and temperate species to understand whereabouts in New Zealand we are actually seeing those greater transitions um, in range dynamics, some of what Matt was describing earlier. And there are some native species that we should really be keeping an eye on. So um, one of those species, I'll just use the example here, is um, the long-spined urchin, Centrostephanus reduceri. So this species has a very well-documented range extension um, through Tasmania. So it's native to Tasmania. It's also native to New Zealand. And in the trail of this range extension that was over about 30 years, what we saw was the um, urchins turned what was a healthy kelp forest into a barren's habitat, where we saw local extinction of several native species, but also um, the decline in several species that are important for fisheries, so namely abalone and also um, crayfish. Well, they caught lobster there, but it's the same crayfish we have in New Zealand. So massive decline to the point where local government stepped in and made a decision to start culling what is a native species because of the detrimental impacts it was having in a region of New Zealand that it was non-native to. There's also been a really lucrative commercial fishery set up around this species in Tasmania in a way um, trying to moderate the population but also give some value back to those people whose livelihoods were really um, impacted by this range extension event. So we have this species in New Zealand and we have little understanding about what its range dynamics have been in the recent past. Um, there's anecdotal evidence or talk about the fact that there is increasing in abundance. And I know Nick Shears has um, a couple of populations that he's had time series data for. So he can say um, robustly that there is, uh, has been a change in abundance for, their, for those places. But this is where um, my master student, Jenny Ann, has been leading some research to look at alternative ways of, of inferring those past range and population dynamics of native species in New Zealand, and in this case, um, Centra Stephanus. So what she did was she used the size structure of populations, and I'm just presenting a small snippet of her work here to give you an idea, but basically she um, used a Bayesian modeling approach to infer what are signatures of range extinction. Um, and she validated her model based on data from colleagues in the University of Tasmania who had um, data for this species in Tasmania where we know exactly how the range extinction happened. And what we can see that is that when we apply that same model to New Zealand, we see a similar signature of range extinction in New Zealand from North Cape down to the Hauraki Gulf. And then beyond that point, Hauraki Gulf and Bay of Plenty, we see a more, more complex population history and recruitment dynamics there. I'm not going to unravel uh, all of this right now because there's a lot to it, but I just want to also point out that um, to try and understand what's going on in that Bay of Plenty area, um, Jenny Ann has also been doing population genomics, so looking and investigating how population connectivity and codependence of populations may have changed over recent decades, where we know there's probably been change to our ocean climate. And in a nutshell, we can see that the metapopulation structure inferred based on this genetic connectivity um, has changed um, in, in the last 15 years, as opposed to prior to that, that's as much resolution as we can get from the age structured sampling of the population. Um, and in particular, we can see, for instance, that Fakare White Island looks like the younger generations of these urchins are locally recruiting. They're from that one place and no other place seems to be reliant on that population. As opposed to uh, Tahua, Mare Island, we can see there in blue, it is a really important node or population within that metapopulation structure, meaning that it probably is a vital connector for this um, species in terms of being a source for other populations. So I'm going to leave um, 
my snippet of talking about the responses that we know of in terms of marine biodiversity to New Zealand's local um, climate change here. There's lots of people to thank. There's lots of ongoing work, but I will take this opportunity to say that this data set and these data are not perfect. And I don't think we'll ever get to a point where we have that perfect information to describe um, those biodiversity responses to climate change. But what I'm really happy about today is that we're all here knowing that we don't have perfect information, but we are ready to have a conversation about taking responsibility and acting on what we know and think might happen in future in order to safeguard, I guess, um, our marine populations, ecosystems, and also the ways in which our livelihoods and our well-being rely upon those spaces. So really pleased to be here and thank you very much for listening. Kia ora.